Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of OTVJ. So today we're just going to quickly talk about the brachial plexus. It's just going to be a general quick review. So let's begin. So the brachial plexus is a complex network of nerves, right, which supplies our muscles and skin to the upper extremity, which basically means that our body gets our sensory and muscular innervation uh, through the brachial plexus, right? Which is why we're able to have that sensory input and or that motor output, which is how we're able to get our sensory and uh, motor innervation through our upper extremity. And so our brachial plexus originates from the base of our neck and it goes underneath the clavicle, right? Right before entering our armpit or our axilla. And then finally, it goes through our entire upper extremity. So from this picture, we're just going to quickly talk about the different components in our brachial plexus. So as we said that uh, our trunks are formed at the base of our neck, right? So as you can see, the superior trunk is a combination of C5 and C6 uh, roots. The middle trunk is a continuation of the C7 roots and our inferior trunk is a combination of C8 and T1 roots. Now this is important because as you can see from this picture, we talked about how if you can see the C5 innervates the shoulder, C6 with the elbow, C7 for our wrist and the C8 and T1 for our hand. And this gets really important for later on when we start talking about the different brachial plexus conditions. And so eventually our trunks divide into the anterior and posterior division. And then once our anterior and posterior divisions have entered through the axilla, or again, the armpit, right, they form into three chords. And the three chords is the lateral chord, the medial chord, and the posterior chord. And this is going to be super important because let's talk about the different nerves that arise from the chords. Right, for example, the median nerve arises from the lateral and medial cords of the brachial plexus. The radial nerve innervates from the posterior cord from the brachial plexus, and our ulnar nerve arises from the medial cord of the brachial plexus. For the purposes of this lecture, we're only just going to talk about the radial, median, and ulnar nerves. And this gets super important for later on as we talk about the conditions and, of course, the functional implications that the brachial plexus has on our daily activities. So we're going to quickly talk about some of the most common brachial plexus conditions. And again, we're only going to be talking about just two. We're going to talk about Erb's palsy and Clunky's palsy. And I know with the brachial plexus, there are so many different conditions we can talk about. But for the purposes of this lecture, I'm only going to focus on Erb's palsy and Clunky's palsy. So Erb's palsy, it's known as a higher brachial plexus injury, and it commonly occurs through difficult birth. And there's just stretching of the C5 and C6 nerve roots, right? And with Erb's palsy, we can see that there's adduction, right? ADD, duction, and internal rotation of the shoulder. And the elbow is extended with the forearm pronated and the wrist is flexed, right? And it's demonstrating a position called waiter's tip. And in terms of the sensory functions, right? So as you can see, we have a loss of sensation in the lateral aspect of the arm during herbs palsy. Okay, and the second brachial plexus condition we're going to talk about is called clunky's palsy. So clunky's palsy, it's a lower brachial plexus injury, right? Which is due to a compression of the C8 and T1 nerve roots, right? And this again is through either difficult birth or, you know, falling from a certain height and landing in excessive abduction of your shoulder. And what's important to know that with Clunky's palsy, it results in a claw hand deformity. Because if you remember when we talked about the C8 and T1 nerve roots, right? We saw that it affects the hand. And if you remember what a claw hand deformity, right? Remember when we talked about the lumbricals and the function of the lumbricals is to flex the MCPs as well as extend the IPs. So if the lumbricals are paralyzed, right, then the opposite will occur, such as hyperextension of the MCP joints as well as flexion of the IP joints. Does anybody remember what muscles are responsible for that? Um, 
And in terms of the sensory functions, right, we talked about how there's a loss of sensation along the medial side of our arm with Plumkey's palsy. So how does brachial plexus affect occupational performance? Well, we know that with both Herb's palsy as well as Klumke's palsy, right, there's so many different things that happens. So of course, our ADLs, our, ID, our IADLs are going to be affected as well as our work and different daily living activities, such as uh, retrieving linens from our closet or even folding laundry, let's say, or making a meal, um, taking a shower, right? When we have to hold that bar of soap or, uh, you know, different grooming activities we want to do or, you know, different grooming activities, feeding, right? Sexual activity, a variety of our different daily living activities are just going to be affected, right? Due to brachial plexus injuries. And always just remember with herbs palsy, Klumke's palsy, or different brachial plexus injuries, what, what is happening, right? right? What are the sensory and uh, motor deficits that we can see? And as a result, always do an activity analysis, right? So if you remember when we talked about Klumke's palsy, we talked about the intrinsic minus, right? We talked about the claw hand deformity. So knowing the muscular as well as the sensory deficits that may occur with Klumke's palsy, let's say, do an activity analysis. What are some of the activities that are going to be severely affected? And you can do the same with herbs palsy or just a variety of any condition, really. So remember before when we talked about the median nerve arises from the lateral and medial cords of the brachial plexus. The radial nerve comes from the posterior cord of the brachial plexus, as well as the ulnar nerve coming from the medial cord of the brachial plexus. What are the functional implications? So remember with the median nerve, remember the different muscles we talked about from our first lecture, right? We talked about how the median nerve innervates our, our pronators, wrist flexors, finger flexors, our thenar muscles, right? In our radial nerve, we talked about our uh, extensors, right? Elbow extensors, finger extensors, wrist extensors. And the ulnar nerve, we talked about our intrinsic hand muscles. Remember how we talked about how the median nerve affects occupational performance. Remember, there's going to be a loss of thumb opposition, a weakness of pinch, fine motor coordination, forearm pronation, as well as uh, difficulty with functional movements such as grasping a chocolate bar off the table, let's say. And remember how the radial nerve affects occupational performance. We're going to have some difficulty with manipulating objects, right? The inability to extend our fingers, thumb, wrist, and radially, and radially abduct, right? ABD, to release objects. And remember that the radial nerve allows the hand to produce graded functional motor control tasks and of course, it is going to be essential to our kinodesis function, as well as it's going to affect our ability to conduct basic self-care tasks. And finally, how does our ulnar nerve affect our occupational performance? Remember when we talked about with an ulnar nerve injury, right? There's going to be loss of grip strength. There's going to be difficulty with gross grasp, such as manipulating a doorknob. Um, there's also going to be a uh, difficulty with lateral pinch, as well as the inability to perform in-hand manipulation tasks, such as moving coins in your hand and inserting them in, let's say, a slot machine for when you go to Vegas or AC. And in terms of treatment for the brachial plexus, right? We can do some muscle strengthening, range of motion, light stretching. And of course, we want to reduce pain. And we can do that through physical agents modalities, different desensitization techniques. And let's talk about our splinting for brachial plexus injuries. Well, one common splint is called a flail arm splint, and it's just used to provide support and hand function. And in areas of C5 and C6, right, we're going to use slings, which is just going to be fitted around the humerus to support the arm and will allow our hand to engage in different occupations. And finally, the resting hand splint will be fabricated for our flaccid hand or wrist, usually seen with our C8 and T1. Again, it's just going to maintain the functional position and prevent contractures. We'll also give our clients any home exercise programs, 
engage in occupational performance training because again remember it's ot's we always want to think about function and so if our client presents with any of these conditions right we want to help them go back with their daily living and how do we do that always remember your theory whether you want to use motor learning or a biomechanical frame of reference right the biomechanical theory motor learning theory uh, really any theory that you think would be applicable and appropriate for this client. I've always believed that psychosocial interventions are super important, especially for our clients with brachial plexus injuries, because just imagine how this person might be feeling, right? They're going to have difficulty with just doing basic tasks, and it's just going to be frustrating for them. So we want to try to be empathetic and understand where our clients are coming from. And, you know, we just want to help our clients with coping as well as encouraging them to be as functional as possible. And, you know, there's a variety of tactile and proprioceptive input uh, we can use to increase sensory awareness, uh, such as for proprioceptive sensory input, we can do weight bearing, right? We can also use bilateral integration to improve our body scheme and the purpose of the variety of tactile and proprioceptive input, again, is just to increase the sensory awareness. And that's it for today's episode on brachial plexus. Um, I hope you found this useful. If you have, please subscribe to OTBJ on uh, our YouTube channel, as well as our Facebook group. Please visit www.otbj.com for our PowerPoint. And with that being said, I hope to see you guys again next week. All right. Have a great day.